new tools um, and some other application and cell phones. So the, pr the problem of low gain could be solved because in essence it's just consequence of very uh, thick oxide layer which we use in order, uh, to, to create a uh, gate. Uh, but if you do top gate and very good build top gate device as well, uh, you may overcome this problem. So at this point, uh, th there is an optimist, at least on the side of our <coughs> colleagues who are doing design, that you can use it for mixed signal processing, etc. So it, it's still far away from, from commercial, but why yeah, not? Alex, the difference between C and E is not only the PGS. What is the difference between C and E? Where, where is C? The where difference is between picture C and picture E. Okay. Is, uh, I think that. Uh, they, okay, the problem is in the. Okay, let's just give C and D. You have, I see there is a difference. Uh -huh. there, but I, hey, Wang Zhong, what's the difference? I really don't remember. Phase is huh? phase okay, all right. That, so he was trying to do phase modulation. And he's saying the phase is different, that's why it's good. Ah, the phase. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, another question. Uh, I wonder if this nonlinearity can be used for small signals or only for large signals, like a few volts. I have no idea. I think that the large signal, few volts, uh, that we are applying it again, it's just consequence of the. A uh, sick gain outside. So if, if we thin it down, or if we, I'll show some device where we have top gate, so you can apply a very small uh, gate and it will produce some modulation. Again, so the, the large voltage involved because of the, uh, let's say, rudimental state of the technology at this point. So it's not because of some graphene parameters? No, no, no. But back to your question, I don't know whether it would be very feasible at small gates, but hopefully it will. So now I'm, I'm going to some of the specific topic which I'm supposed to cover in this talk. And this is something which we uh, done here beginning from 2006, 2007. So the first part is Raman and the metrology of graphene. And I'll just uh, try to uh, illustrate for the students why knowing some material characterization technique could be crucial for progress in this new material system. So if you don't remember what Raman is, uh, I'll try to explain it real simple. So you, you shine laser light on some uh, semiconductor, some material, and you record whatever is scattered back, reflected back. And most of the light which you will record would have the same frequency, so just regular Rayleigh scattering. But a small fraction of it, approximately 10 to the minus 8, would be shifted in frequency. And the shift in frequency would correspond to phonon modes, some characteristic vibrations of the lattice of given material. Okay, so that's Raman effect. And this could be used as sort of like fingerprinting of given material. Moreover, if you go from bulk material to some nanostructures, you are changing phonon modes, so vibrational frequencies, and your Raman signature will also change. So, and the way how it works, so you know, this is the illustration that I just said. You have a laser, it goes to sample, it goes here, the filter is supposed to filter out Rayleigh light, because which is much more intensive, and then whatever is left goes here, diffraction gradient, and you detect it. And this is how Raman spectrometers work uh, in our lab. So now, why it's so important? Because if you want to start playing with graphene, which has a thickness of just one atomic layer, and by the way, here I put that graphene, by definition, is a single atomic layer of carbon atoms. Because you can see many papers published on graphene where they don't provide any evidence of how many atomic layers you have, and actually play with thin layers of graphite. And there could be important differences uh, for that, I mean, for properties. So now if you want to play with a single atomic layer, you have to come up with something. How do you distinguish it? So originally, uh, as far as the work in Manchester was done, it was a lucky chance that when graphene was placed on a silicon oxide of the thickness, magical thickness of 300 nanometers, you can see it in reflected light because of some superposition in light which reflects from graphene and from the interface between silicon oxide and silicon. Okay? But of course, it's also not very conclusive, so you can guess where you have one layer, where you have bilayer, uh, and then what other alternatives you have. So if you do SEM, it doesn't tell you much whether you have single layer, bilayer, whatever. If you do IFM, in some cases it can tell you, but still not very conclusive. The only conclusive thing was cross-sectional TM, which is, as you know, very expensive and time-consuming, etc. It's a pain, right? So you wouldn't move far in, in this direction if you, every time you have to do cross-sectional TM. Or, of course, you can do low temperature transport studies. So now, luckily, <coughs> Andre Ferrari from Cambridge came up with a paper in 2006. Uh, and he showed that it turns out that graphene has very clear signatures in Raman spectroscopy, in Raman spectrum. Because 
Raman spectrum is very sensitive to number of layers because vibration almost changes as you go from single to bilayer, three layer, etc. And this is my student at the time, Arin Kaliza, who is now at NIST, repeated these measurements right away with samples provided by uh, Gini Laos group. And what you know, you can see here that the single atomic layer, uh, this is G peak, this is 2D peak, this is bilayer. If you go to graphite, this peak would grow fast and it would be more intense than 2D peak. So you can use intensity ratio between G peak and 2D peak as approximate metric, uh, you know, how thick your film is. But more accurate metric, as uh, Andre Ferrari, actually, he used theory of Thomson, showed that would be decomposition of 2D peak. Okay? Now, so, uh, is, and, and again, this is now from Irene uh, uh work, PhD dissertation. So if you change, this is 2D peak now, if you change the number of layers from 1 to 5, you can see there is a clear evolution. It's very reproducible, very robust. And we, we compared with the Andre Ferrari's PRL, it was just one to one. There is very clear evolution of 2D band as you increase the number of atomic planes. And, it's, and you can, decomp you can uh, decompose it into elemental arrangement and just uh, verify it. So why it's so sensitive? There is an interesting uh, physics here also involved. I don't know how much time I, I have to go into it. But so if you look at the phonon dispersion, so again, it's an E202 class, right? Or E216. Uh, so there are a number of modes here. This is phonon branches. So this is a uh, phonon which you see in GP. So it's a regular zone center phonon. And with Raman, you always probe it near gamma point, okay, or almost close to gamma point. The deviation is just a, a, okay, a tiny one. So this phonon is here, zone center phonons. Its intensity is proportional to the interaction volume. So if film thickness increases, it increases. Now, then there is this feature here, real density of state. But you don't normally see it because it's not zone center phonon. In order to see it, you need to have some defects in the lattice. So once you have a defect in the lattice, which can relax uh, absorb momentum, you would, you would see this phonon here as a so-called disordered D-peak. That's why it's also metric for quality of graphene. But in some case, but this 2D mode, which is second order harmonic of D peak, is always present. Okay? And that one is very sensitive to number of atomic plates. And the reason for that is that this is a resonant mode. And for a number of years, people were trying to solve this mystery of this 2D mode for, in the context of graphite. And there were a bunch of alternative models published by different people. The most feasible one is this one. And again, I, I don't have too much time to go into physics, but I'll try to explain it. So it's some so-called double resonant enhanced uh, mo uh, model, and it's due to Thompson uh, and Wright. Interestingly enough, that uh, this spring I, I was in Spain, in Barcelona, giving a talk, the same sort of slide, and some guy asked a question. I explained him Thompson model. He seemed to understand, and then I figured out that it was Thompson himself. So, but, uh, <laughs> but at least he was uh, fine with the explanation. <coughs> so the way it goes, since it's a resonant uh, excitation, you actually excite. Uh, so this is your Dirac cone. You actually excite carrier over here. Then you have some phonon transition to, to here. And if you have defects, you can elastically go back. And, and then this difference in energy would be your D peak. So in order to go parallel, so elastic scattering, you need to have defects. But you can also meet another phonon and then go back. And the difference in energy would be uh, 2D. So this is a double energy. Okay. Uh, that's about as much as I can say now. And uh, Ferrari cast this model for graphene. So after that, people accepted it, and it became standard technique to count number of layers. So it's not cross-sectional TM. You can just put any flake, and it's, it could be sort of like even industrial scale. You know, you just have to look at the Raman and, and uh, decompose mode, and it allows you to, to, to separate flakes. And it's, of course, much more accurate than AFM or anything else. We also tried it on different substrates, and even though substrate is very bad, there's a lot of defects by decomposition. This is, for example, this is bilayer on, gla on, on, okay, on glass. And even if you have a pretty weird-looking noisy spectrum, you still can decompose it into elemental peaks and can tell that, yeah, this, is, this is, looks like bilayer, okay? So now, here's the disclaimer which I forgot to mention. All experiments which we do in our lab come from mechanical exfoliated graphene as a source of, gra of uh, and we exfoliate it from bulk graphite. As a source of graphite, we try everything. There is a Kish graphite, which is expensive. There is a HOPG graphite. 
And we also had some homegrown graphite, which is produced in a group of Professor Abashian, who happened to be Dean of Engineering. So, and with all these methods, we can also use Raman spectroscopy as a, not only an metrology tool to count, to count the layers, but we can also use it to, to check the quality uh, of, of the material. Because as I, as I mentioned, this is D-band. So if you don't have any defects, this D-band is not <laughs> present. Because uh, the, the, the phonons which create the real phonon density of states, not in gamma point, okay? So you need to have some defects in order to, to resolve. So by looking at the intensity of this peak or comparing it with G peak, you can tell you know, whether you have a high quality gra uh, graphene or not. Okay. Another, another example of application of this uh, Raman uh, metrology was, in, uh, with, was our study of electron beam irradiation of graphene. So this project was not my idea, it was entirely of my student's idea. Uh, it was a Dest Hans idea. So the question which he asked at the beginning, when we look at graphene with ICM, do we introduce any sort of damage to it? Okay? And people routinely do it you know, when they fabricate devices and analyze them. And it turns out that actually you do. Uh, so even low energy, electron energy irradiation, with very relatively small dose, can produce substantial change. And, and the best tool, again, to monitor it is Raman spectroscopy. Because as I, I mentioned, so this is pristine, high quality graphene, there is no D peak at all. So you only have this G peak, which is everything fine. After only seven minutes of irradiation, you have a huge D peak, right? And most interesting thing also, the evolution is not monotonic. So then, if you continue to irradiate, it actually goes down to some degree. Why is that? Oh yeah, that's what I'm going to explain. So what happens there, there are several uh, uh, competing sort of explanations, but the energy that which we give to electrons that hit graphene is relatively small. So it's from 5 to 20 kilo EV, and it's not sufficient to do uh, ballistic injection, uh, ballistic, okay, kick, to, to kick out carbon atoms from the lattice. It requires about 80. So, but it's sufficient to introduce some sort of chemical reaction on the surface, okay? And uh, so what can possibly happen is that we are breaking some bond, and in some cases, you can also have formation of some sites of sp3 bond. And moreover, when you have a water vapor and some organic contaminants on the surface, that, that also all start to react, and you can have formation of some defects on the graphene surface. That results in the appearance of this uh, DP. Now, why it's not monotonic? Uh, we don't know it exactly as yet, but what we notice, this is, a, this is what we call the uh, so Ferrari, for his study of diamond-like carbon, I think, uh, called it uh, graphitization curve. But what may possibly happen is that when the dose is small, first you get some sort of uh, nanocrystallites formation. So you have certain amount of disorder. And this is big D peak, so it's intensity of D to G. But if you keep doing it, you go quite closer to amorphous stage. And as I said, people observed it in other carbon materials. And then the peak this you know, goes down in intensity because it's now more, more like an amorphous stage, okay? And, and there are some also details here about it. You have only one point. Uh, mm -hmm. You couldn't have one point between zero and seven minutes. Uh, yeah. No, we tried different points, it's just whatever I have it on the slide. Just put whatever yeah. So, there. yeah, we did try and it approximately goes like this. So first we have enhancement. Then. Uh, another interesting thing here is that this damage is reversible until certain, certain dose. So if you give some dose, let's say if you go to stage one and then you heat it up and do annealing, it can go back. And this is electrical conductivity, electrical current. But if you put too much, then it, you, you do not recover electrical properties. So why we think it's interesting, I, I don't get I have time to go into detail of it. We can actually induce transport gap, so sort of uh, suppress uh, conduction in, uh, in, in, when it's needed. And it could be used also for some sort of processing. So you, you radiate certain regions and you convert them from conducting to insulating, etc. Okay, now, but the more fun thing was that when we figured out, let's try to do uh, the measurements Raman peaks at different temperature. So let's see how G peak would change its position as you change the temperature. And then we kind of, so again, this samples were provided by uh, Gini Lau's group. It's, uh, that was the uh, work in 2007. So we pretty uh, fast got this data when G peak goes to the smaller wave numbers. 
So for most of materials, 